Now, we tend to flip back and forth from thinking we've got everything under control to thinking that everything is burning down and we desperately need God's help. You see, I know just in and of myself that, that I have a tendency to be reactive in prayer. If something bad will happen, I can't fix it on my own, so I get on my knees and pray. But the reality is that I need God every second of every day. And the amount that you pray is directly correlated to your understanding of your need for God. Well, good morning, everyone. And welcome to the final week of Summer Sundays 2024. I hope that it's been a somewhat relaxed and peaceful start to the year for you and your family. It's always a blessing to see the whole church together in one service like this, even if the car park is just a little full. It's just a slight inconvenience that I'm sure we could bear. It's not a problem at all. We're going to have a look at Daniel chapter 6 today. It's a challenging passage of scripture because once again, Daniel's life is on the line. And that's something that you would notice happens in his story over and over again. He's living in exile, in in a culture, in a world that was just so far from God. And because of that, we look at his life and we see him facing trial after trial. He, He had to endure things that you and I can't imagine because it's just not something that we face here in Australia. But the truth is that actually there are brothers and sisters of ours all around the world doing it tough, just like Daniel, right now. And we, we read stories like this, and, and sometimes we just kind of keep it in that thing. It's like we think, oh, this is something that happened 3,000 years ago in another part of the world. And that's true. But actually, this stuff is real. It's not just something that happened 3,000 years ago. It's happening all around the world right now in some of the toughest places to be a Christian around the world. Which is why I want to finish this morning by sharing a story with you about a lady named Marize Amarizade. She's what I would call a modern day Daniel, a saint. She's got incredible courage, incredible faith. She's living this stuff out right now. And so I want to share her story with you. But before we do that, let's check out our passage this morning in video form. Stories of the Bible. Daniel in the lion's den. This is Daniel, who was a Jewish man who was taken to Babylon when he was very young. Mm -hmm. Daniel loved God and followed God's rules. He talked to God three times a day and asked God for help often. Daniel served in the Babylonian king's court for many years. Yeah, I know him and under many kings. Hey, Daniel. Daniel always proved himself to be more capable than all the other court officials. I hear a lot of things. Well, anytime. Daniel was serving under King Darius, and because of his great abilities, the king made plans to place him in charge of the entire empire. Wow, okay. The other court officials searched for some fault in Daniel, but they couldn't find anything wrong with him. He was faithful, responsible, and completely trustworthy. The court officials realized the only way to get at Daniel would be to challenge his faith. Come on! So they went to King Darius. Excuse me, Your Majesty. And advised him to make a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone except King Darius will be thrown into the lion's den. I like it. King Darius signed this law, and once a Babylonian king signed a law, it could not be overruled. When Daniel learned of this law, he went home and knelt down, as he always did, to pray in his room with the windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he always had done, giving thanks to God and asking for his help. The officials went to Daniel's house and found him praying. Gotcha! They went to the king and reminded him of the law. I remember. Well... Then they said that Daniel had been found praying to God three times a day. What? When the king heard this, he was very upset. Get over here. And he spent the whole day trying to think of a way to save Daniel. Wait, what? 
By that evening, the court officials came back to the king <coughs> and reminded him that no law signed by the Babylonian king could be overruled. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den. The king said to him, May your God, who you serve faithfully, rescue you. Then the lion's den was sealed shut with Daniel inside. The king spent the night fasting and couldn't sleep. Then very early in the morning, the king hurried to the lion's den. He called out, Hey Daniel! Was your God able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, Long live the king! My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouths so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be taken out of the lion's den. Then the king ordered the men who had schemed against Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den as punishment. Daniel was safe. There was not a scratch on him, for he trusted in God. All right. It's the message, I think. I'm not sure what translation, but that's okay. All right. That's Daniel chapter 6. It's a challenging passage of Scripture. So here's what we're going to do this morning, because we're going to try to fit it into 15 minutes. That's a difficult task, right? So this is what we're going to do. We're going to have a look at three lessons from Daniel chapter 6. And I'm going to tell you about the lady that I spoke about before, Marise Amarizade. And that's going to lead us to the why. Why? Why would you do this? So here's the first thing that stood out to me from Daniel chapter 6. The video said they couldn't find anything wrong with him. He was faithful and responsible and completely trustworthy. They knew the only way they could get to Daniel was to challenge his faith. That's the first thing that I want you to write down this morning. Kids, this is for you too, because school can be rough. Let's be honest, okay? And bullying is a thing. So here's the first thing for you. If you're going to suffer, right? If you're going to suffer for anything, make it your faith. If they're going to come after you for anything, the adults in the room, if they're going to try to cancel you or attack you or drag you down for anything, make it your faith. First Peter chapter 2 says, for it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious, conscious sorry, of God, their faith, their obedience to him, right? But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? Spoiler alert, there's no credit. You just, that's what you deserve, right? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called. And I don't know if we like that line, kind of erase that one from our Bibles, but it is this. To this you were called. Why? Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And what are his steps? Well, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth when they hurled their insults at him. He did not retaliate when he suffered. He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. For you, that is you and me, we were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your soul. He says we were like sheep. We were lost, we were like sheep going astray, but not anymore. No, we're following Jesus. There's a sense of, of purpose and direction in that. It's amazing privilege, right? It gives us this eternal sense of purpose, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. And I don't know how we got to that conclusion, and yet so many of us fall into that trap that we think it's going to be easy. But Jesus never promised that. In fact, he promised the very opposite. And even if we just looked at Jesus' life, let's be honest, be real for a second. Well, Jesus was blameless. He lived the perfect life, and yet he suffered. He was persecuted. He faced injustice and corruption, which means two things. Number one, he gets it. And that's important. He's not indifferent to your suffering. Now, he walked the road of Calvary. He gets it. So if you're here this morning and you're doing it tough and you're facing injustice and you're facing persecution, here's some hope for you. Jesus has been where, you've been where you are right now. 
He's faced what you're facing. He gets it. That's beautiful. Number two, as you suffer for your faith, as you follow in his footsteps, you need to know that the destination is glory. I mean, Paul is just so clear in Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Those who share in his suffering will also share in his glory. That's what Paul says. If we share in his suffering, we share in his glory. Now, some of you hear that and think, whoa, what a privilege. Like that, it's astronomical. We couldn't imagine sharing in his glory. But let's be real for a second. Some of us hear that and think, well, I don't know. It doesn't sound like that great of a deal, to be honest with you. I'd rather just not suffer. And, and I get it, I really do. But that says to you and me that we've lost sight of the majesty and the wonder of Jesus. We've lost sight of his glory. Philippians chapter 2 says that he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. It's what makes Jesus so beautiful. He did that for you and me. But the very next verse says, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, he's King. Right now, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father as the place of honour. In heaven, the place of honour is Jesus's. He's the King. He is preeminent. That's what Paul says. That word means that he surpasses all things. He's the greatest. Well, my son would say he's the goat, and he is. He's the goat. And the goat says that if you share in my suffering, you will also share in that glory. The glory that is rightfully the one and only begotten Son of God. You get to share in that. And the more that you understand the majesty and the wonder and the glory that is rightfully Jesus, the more that that will mean to you. As you fix your eyes on Jesus, actually, it will become something that's beautiful to you. But it is the first lesson that we see in Daniel chapter 6. If you're going to suffer for anything, and Jesus promises that you will suffer, so if you're going to suffer for anything, if they're going to come after you for anything, make it your faith. A life lived in obedience to the Father. That's the road that Jesus walked and it ends in glory. And that's beautiful. The next thing the video said was, when Daniel learned of this law, he went home and knelt down as he always did to pray. He prayed three times a day, just as he always had done, giving thanks to God and asking for his help. Now, I could talk about the fact that Daniel responded in prayer, which is a fantastic response, by the way. Because prayer is powerful. It changes things. It brings things into being that otherwise would not be. It's one of the greatest gifts that we've been given. It's incredible. But what I really want to focus on is that word, always. You see, I know just in and of myself that, that I have a tendency to be reactive in prayer. If something bad will happen, I can't fix it on my own, so I get on my knees and pray. It's almost like that fire alarm that says, in case of emergency, break glass. That's, that's how I treat prayer sometimes, but that's not what we see in Daniel chapter 6. Well, this didn't come up out of the blue. This, isn't, this is something that he did every single day. He had a rich, a vibrant prayer life because he lived in a place of dependency. And we tend to flip back and forth from thinking we've got everything under control to thinking that everything is burning down and we desperately need God's help. And there's an element of truth in that. But the reality is that I need God every second of every day. There is not a moment in my life where I'm not completely dependent upon the goodness and the grace of God. And that's a life-giving truth that Daniel had grabbed hold of. That's why we see him on his knees three times a day, every single day. And the amount that you pray 
is directly correlated to your understanding of your need for God. So if you've bought into this reality where you think that actually I don't really need him, I've got this, I can do it on my own, guess what? You're not going to pray, not until things go horribly wrong. But a dependent life is a prayerful life. It is. So here's the beautiful truth of this passage. Daniel's not on his knees because of King Darius' decree. Now, he was already there because that's how he lived. A dependent life is a prayerful life. We see that in Daniel chapter 6. Which brings me to the last lesson. And this is a really simple one. And we would all probably know this as we get older, right? There's just so much in life that we can't control. So much that goes on around us that we're powerless to change. I encourage you to do this. If you were to go away and read Daniel 6 on your own this afternoon, you'll notice that in this chapter, Daniel is almost a side character. Well, so much of this has nothing to do with him. It's just kind of happening around him. But what shines through in the midst of circumstances that are completely outside of his control is Daniel's unwavering trust. Verse 23 makes that so clear. It says, when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Now, here's the key. We know how this story ends. We know that Daniel lives. So we read that and we go, yeah, that makes sense. God delivered you, of course you trust him. But he didn't know that. And it's actually not the kind of trust that Daniel had. He wasn't trusting in God for a good outcome. He was trusting God with himself. His very life. And he's saying, no matter what happens, God, whether I live or die, I know that you're good. I know that you love me and I trust you. No matter the outcome. Now, that's a completely different thing. That's a trust that's independent of his circumstances, which is incredibly challenging for us because so often our trust is built on our circumstances. So I'll trust you, God, as long as it's easy. I'll trust you, God, as long as I get the outcome that I want. And this comes from a place of love, but I need you to hear me. That's not trust. That's not it. And it's not what we see in Daniel chapter 6. We see the same thing in the fiery furnace. And we believe that our God would deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we won't bow down and we worship. This is our God and King and we trust him with ourselves, our very lives, with our everything, no matter the outcome. It's an unwavering trust in the goodness of God. It's challenging, but it's powerful because nothing can touch you. Which brings me to Marisa Amarizida and the why. I'm gonna give you an incredibly brief version that's her, by the way, Iranian lady. I'm going to give you an incredibly brief version of an interview that she did with Nikki Gumpel. So if you want to listen to the whole thing, just Google it. Nikki Gumpel and that right there. Her name is very hard to say. I could be slaughtering it, but I'm doing my best. Mariza Amarizadeh. That's my best attempt, right? Now, just to give you a little bit of context, she grew up in Iran, and she grew up what I would call a, a devout Muslim. And I don't just mean that she did the right things, but I mean that her heart was genuinely seeking after God, right? So she, she prayed every day, she read the Quran, but there was, she was earnestly and, and diligently seeking after God. She talks about the fact that even as a Muslim, she was seeking a relationship with Allah. And yet she says, something just didn't feel right. There was, there was something missing. She had a longing for something more, even as a little girl, right? And then one day everything changed. She had a dream or a vision. She saw a white horse like the one that we read about in Revelation chapter 19. And this is what she said, this is her quote, I felt its love pouring into me with a power and a purity I had never known. And that was the turning point for Marisa. She rejected Islam and started a journey of exploration. Still so much to go. She doesn't know who Jesus is yet, right? Along that journey, there are a number of miracles that pointed her towards the gospel, towards Jesus. 
First time that she went to church in Iran, which is kind of sketchy in and of itself, right? You don't put that on Facebook, just going to church this morning. No, probably not. Finds a church, they're underground, and then sneakily goes to one. First time she goes, she encounters the Holy Spirit in a way that was just overwhelming. She receives healing, but then she had also a vision of Jesus. She says, it was like he was standing right there in front of me. It was like he was right there. This is powerful stuff. She's got to remember, she's only 17 when all this is happening. This is later. This is a couple of years ago. But this is 17 when all this is happening in an incredibly hostile environment. A couple of years later, she continues to press in and to learn about it, to, to follow and to press into this guy named Jesus. She moves to Turkey so she can go and study at Bible college, which is awesome. Turkey is a safe place that she can go do that. She finishes her degree. Her life's been completely transformed. She could have done anything right. She's out. And Turkey's free, relatively safe. She could have just stayed there, could have gone anywhere. She feels compelled to go back to Iran. Or another lady called Mariam Rostenper were just convinced that God wanted them to smuggle Bibles into Iran. So that's what they did. They'd sneak out at night and leave Bibles in people's mailboxes. It's something they did for a number of years. And in the end, they distributed around 20,000 Bibles in the very heart of the Islamic Republic of Iran, in Tehran, their city. Now you want to talk about faith under pressure. You want to talk about someone daring to follow God. I just think that Marizera is an incredible woman of God. And she was willing to risk her life to follow Jesus. And it nearly cost her everything. Because here's where the downward trend of the story. Eventually they got caught. They go to one of the most horrible prisons you could imagine. They spent eight months in that prison. I won't go into details because there's kids here. But you can imagine the conditions the difficulties they faced. They were interrogated every single day. They wanted Marizah to sign a document, a statement, renouncing her faith. She says, you just sign this thing, we'll let you go. And day after day, she says, no, I won't sign that. She kept praying, kept worshipping, kept trying to share her faith with the guards and the other prison inmates in there with her. And that might sound crazy to you. Why wouldn't you just sign it? Why don't we just sign it and get out and go somewhere else and serve the Lord somewhere else? But for Marisa, it just wasn't an option because Jesus had changed her life, flipped her world upside down. She tasted and seen the goodness of God, the depth of his love. She calls it an otherworldly love, foreign, like nothing she'd experienced before. She seen, tasted and seen the depth of his love and it was something she just wasn't willing to let go of. So it drove her through all of this, the love of God expressed in the person of work of Jesus. And it reminds me of John chapter six. This is the why. Jesus is talking to this enormous crowd about the fact that he is the bread of life. He says, very truly, and this is tough, right? He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And the crowd hear that and think, man, this is crazy. What's happening here? We can't, it's just too much. So what do they do? Most of them leave. 90% of the crowd go. Jesus turns to his disciples, the 12, and he asks them, are you going to leave as well? And Peter's answer is the key. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Now you have the keys. You have the word, sorry, of eternal life. And we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. That's what Mary Zara had discovered. That's the heart of someone who dares to follow God no matter the consequences. Hey, you get to a place where you have a rock solid faith that even under pressure you might live for Jesus. You have the words of eternal life. We've tasted it. We know it to be true. We're not letting go. We're grateful that you're not letting go of us. That's the heart of someone who would say, Jesus, no matter what, I'm with you. No matter what you put in front of me, I'm following, I'm stepping in. You have the words of eternal life. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, I thank you for that truth. You do have the words of eternal life that in you we have tasted and seen something that is not of this world, a goodness that is found nowhere else, a love that we cannot fully understand. Thank you, Jesus, that your presence changes everything. It changes us from the inside out. We've heard about it this morning. That in you there is life and hope and peace and purpose. There's a joy that's independent of our circumstances. It's the stuff that everyone is searching for, but can be found nowhere else. And yet we have it in you, Jesus. Fullness of life. And so, Father, I pray that we'd have our eyes fixed on you. We wouldn't take for granted who you are, what it is that you've done for us, but also, Jesus, that we wouldn't keep you at arm's length, that we would press in, we'd seek intimacy with you, our God and our King, that we might know that life, that hope more and more and more. And as we know it and as we embrace it, Jesus, that it would build in us a faith that is resilient. And that we would be a people who would dare to follow you, no matter the pressure, no matter the consequences. So we know what you are and we know what you've done. That you flipped our world upside down. You have the words of eternal life. Where else would we go? May that be us. This I pray for in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.